a way where you could be too intimate with the place, and so that they wouldn't want to send you to them. Oh, like you had too much past experience if your family's from there, or? Yeah, you've lived uh, there before, you speak the language. I, mean, I don't know if it would be intimacy, it would be like whether you've really done like a whole bunch of research already in, in a locale. So even that somewhat could be a boom in some instances. Like I, I think if, if you propose something that was very similar to something that you've already done that's a little fudged, they might just see that they might want to give the opportunity to somebody else. So, you know, it would be probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I read that it's preferred if you haven't resided or studied in that country for more than six months. So, that would yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that has become less stringent over the years, mm -hmm. that requirement. But well, they probably realize that a lot of the best prepared candidates have resided in these places before. Exactly. They, they finally have gotten the idea of especially to build an affiliation, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, really, it's really instrumental to have been there. So yeah. they've really relaxed that in the last you know, three or four years. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, but if you've already done a full long project and you know, you're a doctoral student and you already have a dissertation topic, you, know, you probably aren't going to get a full grade. Yeah. But I don't think that applies to you. So yeah. So. This is correct, but my question is that the preferences and some of the policies are different from country to country. So you, you know, they have the standard policies that are true of all of the countries, but then you really want to get a sense of what your chosen country, what they're sort of what they really want. Right. In fact, like in the in the yeah. book, in the book, you you know, and this, all this stuff is online. You can read some of the country to country differences. So yeah, some will say exciting. some will say, oh, you know, humanity students prefer. Yeah, and you're like, oh um, <laughs> and then others will say, oh, masters in teaching really prefer. Yeah, like yeah. so they're all and then some will say, oh, with the ETA, um, there's no time for a secondary project. And then the others will say, oh, there there's plenty of time for it. And you've got a proposal. And you've got and you've got a proposal and it has to be in a way similar to the full, but you don't know where you're going to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, actually, that's my big message is to come in to meet um, with Renee or me, and we'll help you kind of get, you know, to sort, sort through the book and start exploring ideas and how a Fulbright might fit into your career plan. So, get online how your odds for certain countries are so dramatically different. Like some countries that are relatively, you think, popular will have like two ETAs available and other countries will have 30. And I was really surprised to see that discrepancy between these countries. There, there are, and not only that, just not, not only the raw numbers of, of scholarships per country, but also like how many people are and they tell historically you are applying. So we, uh -huh. we have overall odds. You thought you have those numbers? Yeah, they're actually published, at least for the ETA. Is it true that ETAs are easier to get than the full research? In general, my response is yeah, that's so you're true. you're not competing with graduate students? I think that grad, I think, like many um, of the, the fellowship advisors across the country believe this. Um, statistically, I think that we're correct. Is that there are many reasons why graduate students have an advantage. One, they have a, more, a better idea of their research and they have a more narrow topic. And they also have the resources of their department. Can you defer a Fulbright? Get a Fulbright? Uh, let's say. Um, the answer is no. So you, if you apply to graduate school at the same time that you apply for a Fulbright and you get a Fulbright, I don't know any school in the country that won't let you defer for yeah. a Fulbright. The schools will let you defer, but not Fulbright. Uh, loans and students who will have an interview with Colgate faculty um, selection committees that um, Professor Roller mentioned. And that interview is so crucial that you go through basically a panel interview, and the panel then assigns you a, a rating. It's one through four, one being the highest. And that Colgate rating is so often so instrumental in becoming a finalist and, and a recipient. So, um, it gives you a chance to also to have a very high level type of interview. So interviewing is, like, besides writing, interviewing is, is the other very hard skill. And it gives you a chance to 
you know, to get practice with such a high level of degree. So every student that successfully applies by the internal deadline will be guaranteed an interview. Do you, would you like to mention anything about like those interviews? Sure. Um, well, I did notice that some students had, I, I think maybe some students had not fully met the internal deadline, like they had still submitted drafts of their statements because we, I felt that there was a big difference between the students who already had their polished final application materials to put in front of this committee versus those who had drafts that they still were planning right. on changing. And you can, you right. can revise your statement right. after the interview. Right. So technically, they were complete in the, that they had. Yeah. They, they, you know, they had all the components turned in. Right. And so, but we certainly use that month to continue to work heavily on. Yeah. And especially after the, the committee's meeting with the student, there could be also new feedback. New feedback, and so we worked, you know, not around the clock, but pretty, but pretty I all, think all the time to, to revise. So, so yeah, it's not like the fifteenth. There isn't still work, especially on the essays. There, there certainly is, but um, I think the interviews are, you know, I think they're exciting. And, uh, but they're also like, I think, very unlike any job interview that you might have had. And um, they ask you about lots of things, how, how you know the culture and um, about well, you can ask anything. I mean, there's no kind of set list of questions, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, in a lot of these, in a lot of interview settings, you know, every candidate gets the same questions and they're already like laid out. But in this case, the faculty get to just ask you Whatever. They can you ask you what books you have at your on your bedstand. You know. So we will often ask you what I was going to say before about whether you have whether you have a polished statement versus still a draft statement at that point. Because we formulate our questions based on the application that you have submitted at that time. If it is polished and is really thoughtful, that influences both our initial perception of you, our initial impression, but also the types of questions. How deep you can go. Um, I think it, I don't know, I think it makes a very different impression if you have a kind of more haphazard looking statement. My goal, my goal for this year is to have every one of the months, September 15th, to be in very good shape, you know, polished and, but, but ready to, you know, um, you know, so, you know, we to incorporate faculty comments, mm -hmm. which are often like right on the mark because of subject expertise. Mm -hmm. Although we are all in different disciplines, so you want to make sure, especially if you're proposing a research grant, that you you write for an audience that is not steeped in your particular discipline or major, since you don't know who right. it's going to be. And that's actually a good point. That leads to me. So they're actually asked yeah, so after the national deadline, it goes to the national level. So there's a collegiate level, then there's a national level, and so it goes to um, one of the United States. Regions through application, and then it is reviewed from pe by people of various disciplines, and then the final level is actually the country level, and so it's reviewed at the consulate or at the embassy itself by mm -hmm. by the country. So we hear about people who are finalists at the end of January, and then we hear about people becoming recipients from the range of early March through June. It's based on the country. Wow, that's a huge range. It is a huge range, and it's like, you know, it gives, what, the good thing is the Fulbright is early, and you can work on other applications and other things, and work on grad school applications, which really should be in, like, the first part of November, or first of November 15th. So, um, it's a good thing to, Fulbright is a great thing to apply to along with grad school. So I'll ask you about your, your, your other career plans, too. Any other questions? I hope you will come and see, hope, hope you'll come and see me. I'm sure you guys are. Yes, just, Go see Steve. Yeah, just come, come in and we'll, we'll get you started, we'll get you set up. It'll be a good process. It'll be, I have to say it's hard. It's, it's probably writing intensive, meeting intensive, as Adam said, but I think it can be a very satisfying one. 
is awesome. Yeah. But I don't ever hear anybody having results applying to Fulbright in the family. Because the big thing is you have the, the boost of the support of the um, Colgate evaluation. It means a lot. Colgate is one of the top Fulbright producing institutions. So it, the name itself goes a lot. Well, thank you. I, I hope to see all of you sometime very soon. <laughs> <laughs>